Thanks, visitor, for joining me on this tour of Panny Bay in Darwin, Northern Territory. Panny Bay has become very upmarket with expensive real estate. At one time, it was home to Vestry Meat Works, serviced by the railway, and a large aerial, uh, aerodrome. There are quite a few things I could talk about in connection to Fanny Bay. One topic is the marvelous beach. With its coastal walk, cycle route, and information about the indigenous people or the saltwater people. The beach really is quite good compared to many of Darwin's beaches, although you still have problems with Portuguese men of war and saltwater crocodiles. You don't really want to go swimming. Another topic that I'm not going to get into is the Fanny Bay Gold or Jail, which is now closed. Pictured from the outside, it's now open to the public and it's well worth a visit. An early view of Fanny Bay showing the Aerodome constructed in 1919 and Vestry Meatworks. One can see that there really was not much settlement. The area was quite empty until it began to develop rapidly in the late 1900s. Instead, I'll talk about the Fanny Bay drone, or the Ross Smith aerodrome, first tacked from the bush in 1919. Here we have the crews that serviced the Spitfires at this site during the Second World War. The banyan tree was probably used for hoisting aircraft engines. The airstrip was hastily prepared in 1919 for the arrival of Ross Smith and the Snickers Bimmy bomber. The paddock behind Fanny Bay Goal was chosen. These banyan trees seem to last hundreds of years and it's still in magnificent condition. The topic of today's video is Aviators Park, situated in the center of Fanny Bay. On the 8th of December 1919, Wiggy and Murphy flew from Melbourne and landed in the Northern Territory. They became the first aviators to land in the Northern Territory, landing in Darwin on the 12th of December. One of the first aircraft to land in the newly created strip, 1919, is pictured here. A major event for the Aerodome in Fanny Bay was the great race from England to Australia. In Aviators Park are some bronze plaques detailing the history In November 1919, Australians Captain Ross Smith and his brother Keith, along with others, 
threw their pickets in the aircraft. They were one of a number in a race to be the first to fly from England to Australia with the Australian Prime Minister, Joey Hughes, putting up 10,000 pounds for the first plane that could do the trip in under 30 days. Ross Smith and his crew made the trip in 27 days. Preparing the route to Australia for the aircraft in the race. Days one to five, Boulogne, France to Taranto, Italy. The pearls of our flight soon began. Shortly after reaching the French coast at Boulogne, we ran into a big bank of clouds. We could not go underneath it. It was practically descended to the ground. We therefore climbed above to a height of 30,000 feet. It was bitterly cold, 25 degrees of frost. Our breath froze. The Vicky Swimmer bomber on arrival. The Vickers Aircraft Company gained immense kudos from the completion of the trip in under 30 days. On day nine, Ross arrived in Persia and camped at the old uh, Turkish battlefield. They were taken care of by the 10th Indian Lancers. There was an enormous storm that night and took a huge crowd of soldiers to hold down the plane and six hours to clear away the debris and sand the next morning. On day 25, landing in Surabaya, Dutch East Indies, that is Indonesia, they landed on a muddy uh, airstrip of reclaimed land that got thoroughly bogged. They had to take off on a bamboo mat 350 yards long with bamboo flying in every direction from the wind prop. Ross and Keith Smith touched down in Darwin at Penny Bay 3.40 p.m. on the 10th of December 1919. 27 days. They shared the 10,000 uh, pounds reward with the crew. A monument to Ross Smith for his achievement. Record breakers, pioneers, and a daredevil doctor. The history of aviation in the Northern Territory is quite fascinating and colorful, but probably a bit too much to cover here. The 1920s was the golden age for aviation because with the development of technology, numerous people eagerly shot faster speeds and longer distances from their planes. A procession of aircraft proceeded through Fanny Bay, ranging from frail biplanes to the purpose-built racing passenger aircraft of the 1934 Darwin Centennial Air Race. Sorry, that's the Melbourne Centennial Air Race. Dr. Fenton was the daredevil 
doctor, a constant thorn in the side for the Department of Civil, Civil Aviation, constantly breaking the rules. the many aircraft traveling overland from England to Australia during the 1920s, Darwin became Australia's northern gateway. Many of the uh, people stayed at the Victoria, Hall, Victoria Hotel on Smith Street. Interesting, the wings fold back on this early plane. This marker on the side of the control tower of the original Darwin Aerodrome, dedicated to the memory of all pioneer pilots who helped develop communication links between Australia and the rest of the world. There are many uh, pioneers who established records and are worth being remembered, but I'll take a look at Amy Johnson. Amy was the first woman to fly solo from England to Australia. She landed in Darwin on Empire Day, 24th of May, 1930, 19 days after having left England, the third fastest time. And a very attractive young lady she was. Amelia Earhart, in Fanny Bay on landing in 1937. Another major event in Fanny Bay was the 1934 Melbourne Air Race. 1934, Sir McPherson Robertson, the confectionery magnet, sponsored a race from England to Australia as part of the Melbourne Centenary Celebration. Darwin was the first Australian port of call, and Fanny Bay, the aerodrome, became a focus of international attention. The race was won by Charles W.A. Slot. Planes arrived at the dome to refuel and continue on through Australia to Melbourne. Purpose built to have in common won the race, so I'm not sure what that looked like. Qantas, the Mopac airline to international carrier. Qantas stands for Queensland and Northern Territory Airline Systems. And Fanny Bay became the center of their operations following the construction of a large hangar. Completion of the hangar. The hangar is still there today and used as a museum of technology. It's no longer used by Qantas Empire Airways. The hangar was an important part of the Qantas route from Australia to Singapore. It was leased by Qantas in 1938. With the Second World War, a large military airstrip was commenced, and this airstrip received only limited use during the war. It was bombed by the Japanese in 1942 and badly damaged, and again badly damaged by Cyclone Tracy in 1974. The famous Qantas service 
an earlier aerial photograph of the Ross Smith Aerodrome. With rapid settlement in the area, the runway was sold for its real estate value and became the Ross Smith Boulevard that exists today. During the Second World War, Fannie Bay did play an important role as the base for a Spitfire squadron. It's occupied by number 12 squadron, equipped with the Anson light bombers and Whirlaway aircraft in July 1939. Australian Air Force runway is shown to the north or top end of this photo and the old Ross Smith Aerodome it's at the bottom next to the beach the old runway of the Ross Smith Aerodome which became Ross Smith Boulevard pictured here in its early days. Thanks, visitor, for accompanying me on this visit to Fanny Bay, and in particular, the aviation part. Appreciate your company and wish you a very pleasant day. <laughs>